Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Galatians verse by verse, and we are beginning chapter 2. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, keenly aware of just how little we know. May the Holy Spirit be the teacher, stripping away that which may be said, which is foolish and ignorant, but teaching, sealing to the hearts of each of us that which is the truth of thy word, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. In our last study together, we were somewhere in the verse of 23, uh, uh, somewhere in the area of verse 23 of chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 23. The Holy Spirit has elected to send this epistle to the churches in the area of Galatia to deal with the subject of justification by faith. There were those who were doing what is done every day in Christianity today. They were saying that in order to make it sure, in order to make it true, there's something that you must do. In this particular case, it was circumcision. You may remember when we studied through the book of Acts that there were those who had said in order to be redeemed, you must be circumcised. And so there arose a great division, a great dissension, that they decided to send a group to Jerusalem to settle the matter once and for all with the apostles. And we'll look at that meeting here shortly. In chapter 2, the Holy Spirit has Paul. Uh, Paul's not authoring this epistle. He's writing it. The, the author is the Holy Spirit. More and more Christianity has slipped away from the inspiration of the Word of God and what, what we hear in Bible teaching over and over again. Uh, it, it's difficult to grasp Paul's thought here, and my response has always been, I don't really care about what Paul thought. I'm interested in what the Holy Spirit has to say. And the Holy Spirit, without question, is using Paul to pen the epistle, but the author is God, and the author starts out by sealing to the churches of Galatia the truth that, pro that Paul, the Apostle Paul is a proper spokesman. What he preaches, he did not receive from man. He, did, he didn't get it from Dallas Theological Seminary. He didn't get it from any source but Jesus Christ. And it was a special revelation given to him. And that's what he was preaching. And we've already gone through the first 22 verses where Paul points out that the minute that he received this revelation, he went into Arabia. We have no idea how long he was there. He returned to Damascus, uh, was there for three years, and he was preaching the truth of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It's 14 years later that he went up to Jerusalem, as we'll see in chapter 2. That makes a total of 17 years uh, from the time that he was converted on the road to Damascus. So as we close out then this chapter, Paul declares that those in Judea had heard only that he was preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. And our discussion last week was what was he preaching? You know, as more and more humanism and human works has crept into modern Christianity, more and more translations and more and more Bible studies say that what he was preaching was you putting your faith in Christ Jesus. The word uh, pistis, pistuo there for faith there is articulated 
He was preaching the faithfulness and, and what he was preaching was the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. Now you have two options. You can say that he was preaching faith in Christ or he was preaching the faithfulness of Christ. You have those two options. I'm saying that that which is consistent with the Word of God is that Paul was preaching the faithfulness of Christ, not personal faith in Christ, and they glorified God in me, says the text. Now, so we had that discussion last week. I have no reason to repeat it again this week, although this point will come up over and over again in this epistle. Is the dominant theme of this epistle personal faith in Christ, or is the dominant theme of this epistle the faithfulness of Christ? And folks, that'll be a decision that you have to make. I have no problem at all telling you that the position of this ministry is that the dominant theme of this epistle is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. But we will see as we go on in the study. No one, no one should agree with me just because that's what I believe. Your responsibility is to search the Scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be so. Truth is not this channel. Truth is the Word of God, and you have a serious responsibility as you hold it in your hand. My prayer every week, among any other request to God, is I don't want to preach error. I would, I'd just as soon God strike me dead than preach error. Now the problem with that is that, that that sounds like I'm saying that I'm not preaching any error, and I know that that's not true. No man has a corner on truth, so it's your responsibility to decide whether or not what is suggested might be what God is teaching. They glorified God in me. They glorified God in me. There are two things we could do. We could point out that Paul the Apostle is going to come here and speak. Boy, you guys ought to hear this fella. He's, he's really something. He's a... He's a graduate of, of three schools. He was brought up in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, uh, which we read in Acts chapter 22. He engaged in business practices that made him a very wealthy man. As I pointed out in numerous times, it's reported that he could pay every working man's wage in the city of Jerusalem for two years, and he gave that all up to preach the gospel. What a wonderful guy. You ought to come here. And that's typical of what we hear today. But dearly beloved, that would not be glorifying God. That would be glorifying Paul. The 24th verse is a simple verse. They glorified God in me. It's a, an imperfect tense. In the Greek, that means that they were in the process of glorifying God and they never completed it. They couldn't complete it. Man could never complete a glorification of God. But what the verse says is that they recognized that it was not Paul who saw that his actions were awful. You know, you know boy, I shouldn't be doing this. You know, I'm persecuting these poor people and and they seriously believe what they believe. And I'm, I'm going to give that up. And I'm going to turn over a new leaf. And I'm going to start preaching the gospel. And folks, that would be glorifying Paul. Paul did not do that. God struck him down on the road to Damascus. Paul had no choice in this at all whatsoever to even suggest that laying there on the ground, blinded from, by the glory of God, that Paul had the option of accepting or rejecting is foolish. It was God who struck Paul and the life of Paul, a ministry of Paul, was such a ministry that they were able to glorify God, not Paul. 
He could have written his personal testimony in such a way that it brought glory to him. Could have done that. But obviously what he was preaching brought no glory to him. It brought glory to God. And I think that's a sobering verse. Is that the way that we run our lives? Is that the way that we run our ministry? Is that the way that we run our witness for Christ? They were in the process of glorifying God in me. Now, I mentioned the verse in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, that Paul was a prototype of all those who should hereafter believe on Jesus Christ. That's you, that's me. Now there's a lot of discussion we could have on that verse. It's already been pointed out to me that maybe we ought to have a whole study on 1 Timothy 1. But at least Paul is an illustration, a model, a prototype, that it is God who called us, we didn't call Him. It was God who sought us, we didn't seek Him. No man seeks after God. It was God who redeemed us, we didn't redeem ourselves. We had no part in it. The Scriptures could not be any clearer. For by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Well, how were they made sinners? Synergistically? No. They were made sinners by the disobedience of Adam. They had no choice in, in that. You know, hey, hey, you want to be a sinner? If you want to be made a sinner, then what you, you got to do is cooperate with Adam. Folks, that doesn't make any sense. No, there was no choice there. In the same verse, in the same way, kathos in the Greek, in the same way, in like manner, in the same manner, the many were made alive by the obedience of Christ. By their obedience? No. By the obedience of Christ, and that's a genitive. Shows possession. 1 Corinthians 15, I declare unto you the gospel. This is the good news that I preached unto you that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day from the dead. That's the good news that I preached to you. The faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Where is any personal choice in that declaration? Well, there is none. Folks, people have unsubscribed from this channel because there's, I don't give any invitations. Well, that's fine. I, you know, people, on, people on here, people, some of my followers have walked out of their churches because there are invitations. So I guess you know, we're kind of even there. Folks, there is no invitation in the Word of God. Someone says, oh yes there is in the book of Revelation. Let him that is a thirst come. Dead people aren't thirsty. Those who are made alive in Christ are thirsty. The invitation is to God's people. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who did he say that to? God's people. Paul preached the faithfulness which once he was trying to destroy. What he was saying is that Jesus Christ is not the Lamb of God slain uh, from the foundation of the world. You know, you're believing the wrong thing. He's not the Messiah. He's not the Lamb of God. He doesn't meet the requirements of Scripture. <clears throat> We've already spent some time looking at what Paul must have gone through in Arabia. He, you know, a, a skilled student in the Word of God to suddenly realize that Jesus of Nazareth Nazareth was the fulfillment of the very prophecies that he had been saying that he wasn't the fulfillment of. Suddenly, the, the Word of God came alive for Paul. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Folks, where's your choice in that? That's what he began preaching. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem. 
The text says this is the first time he went up to Jerusalem and met with the apostles to discuss works, law versus the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. So he had been there before. That's why, that's why the Holy Spirit puts the word again there. This happens to be one of the words that is there in the Greek. I went up to Jerusalem again. Now we know ahead of time he had mentioned that he went up and saw Peter, stayed with him for 15 days. And he also met James, who he wasn't one of the original apostles, but he was the brother of the Lord. And those visits, those visits are recorded in the book of Acts. I went up again to Jerusalem, and I went with Barnabas and took Titus with me. Titus. We also know from the book of Acts that we have the Holy Spirit presenting us the historical picture in Galatians, the doctrinal picture. The Christians at Antioch had decided we ought to have this question settled. Do Jews need to be circumcised to be redeemed? Now, it is staggering to me that any human would suggest anything needs to be done to be redeemed. I don't know what to say to some people. You know, someone grabbed me years ago, you know, and said, you know, I've, I've, Steve, I've been immersed three times, you know, face forward, backwards, once backwards, sprinkled twice, poured once. I mean, do you have a different way of baptism? Because I'd, I'd sure hate to get to heaven's door and find out that I left out something and I can't get in. You got to be kidding. What kind of sacrifice do you think Jesus Christ made? Why should any Christian say, well, you know, I've worked, I've worked for the Lord all my life. I hope my works will get me into heaven. How can any Christian say that who's even read the Bible, let alone studied it? For by grace have you been redeemed, have you been saved, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God having absolutely nothing to do with works, for you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You're not in that verse as far as doing something. Upon good works. Whose works? Jesus Christ's. That God has before ordained that you should walk in them. Them. You walk in the worthiness of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to see in Galatians. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faithfulness of the Son of God. Now, I, I freely admit that mo modern translations won't do that with a genitive. Modern translations make it faith in Christ. It, folks, it's a genitive. Can it be translated faith in Christ? Well, absolutely, of course. Can it be translated the faith of Christ? Absolutely. And what I suggest to you and have done this in study after study, the opening part of Romans chapter 3 says the faith of Abraham. Same genitive. Same construction. And you translate that Abraham's faith. It's the faith of Christ and they translate it faith in Christ. But if it were any word but Christ, if it were any name but Christ, if it were Abraham, if it were Solomon, if it were David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, or it would have been translated Daniel's faith, Ezekiel's faith, Jeremiah's faith, Isaiah's faith, Abraham's faith. But because the name is Jesus Christ, they translated it faith in Christ. I, I am ecstatic that I am not redeemed by my personal faith in Christ, but I am redeemed because Christ is faithful and He died for my sins. He was buried and He rose again the third day from the dead. That's what changed my life and yours. I firmly believe that salvation is by personal faith in Christ 
but, has virtu- but, ha- but that has virtually nothing to do with redemption. You are redeemed by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. You are saved, by delivered by your personal faith and trust in it. Modern Christianity has moved so far from the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ that it becomes man's effort and man's faithfulness that guarantees glory. And I praise God that is not true. I praise God that's not so. You've received it, says the text, and you stand in it. And you'd be saved if you trust in it. If you don't trust, if you don't trust it, you've still received it and you still stand in it. And someone says, oh, no, 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 you don't receive it unless you accept it. And folks, that is not true. That is absolutely not true. God gives you a gift. You've got the gift. I pointed out to you in other studies, that, you know, the pastor in the church in which I was raised, he always used the illustration, you know, you're, you're, you're in a jail cell, you can't pay the debt. I, I, I come along and I pay the debt and they unlock the jail cell. You're not free unless you walk out. He's, the guy's crazy. And he used that illustration Sunday after Sunday. Dearly beloved, I'm free. Now I can choose to sit in that jail cell. I'm I'm not in debt, but I sit there a free man because the debt's paid. Somehow or other, we've made the final stroke of redemption, the work of man, and according to 1 Corinthians 1, that makes the work of Jesus Christ... Zero. If you're the variable in the equation, the constant work of Christ means nothing. There is not a single verse of Scripture, not one, not one passage of Scripture that would shore up any belief that you are redeemed by your personal faith in Christ, and yet that's taught every day. I have grand news for you. Dearly beloved, Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day from the dead. That's simple language. Simple language. What does that language mean? What if the price that He paid for your sins was not sufficient? Well, then He'd still be dead. That little expression, He rose from the dead, is the guarantee that God was satisfied, that He was propitiated that the debt was paid. If the debt is paid, you don't pay it. I went up to Jerusalem and communicated unto them the good news which I preach among the Gentiles. What was that good news? Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day from the dead, victorious over death because the price He paid was sufficient. You see the same thing in Romans chapter 4. He was delivered because of our transgressions and He was raised again because we were made righteous. Therefore, having been made righteous by the faithfulness of Christ, we have peace with God. And what a peace it is. That's the glory of the Gospel, folks. Jesus paid it all. We sing that hymn, but we don't live that in our lives. Fourteen years after he went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with him. Why did he take Titus? The church at Antioch commissioned Paul and Barnabas to go up and settle a question concerning law versus grace, law versus the finished work of Jesus Christ, and anything you add to it means it was unfinished. Popular evangelism says Jesus Christ started a process which which you have to finish. That's not biblical truth. But why did he take Titus? Because Titus was a Greek. And Paul, I believe, was led by the Holy Spirit to take him as a test case. There would would be nothing worse in the eyes of a Jew to say that someone was was uncircumcised. That, That wasn't only a... That was not only a slang expression, it was a terrible sneer. To be uncircumcised would be a, a, 
about the worst a Jew could say about anyone. Titus was a Greek. And I went up by way of revelation and I communicated unto them that good news which I preach among the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 15, we're told that the brethren at Antioch decided that they ought to send a group to Jerusalem to kind of thrash this thing out with the apostles. In Galatians, we're told that, that Paul went up by revelation. Now, I think both of those are true. There's no doubt in my mind that the Holy Spirit led the believers at Antioch to commission Paul and Barnabas to go to Jerusalem. I don't, I don't, I don't believe Paul had one sliver of a doubt that what he was preaching was truth. And there wasn't any reason in his mind to have anybody else put a stamp on what he knew to be truth. He had a revelation from God. He had met Jesus Christ face to face. What he said in chapter 1. So I believe it's the Holy Spirit that said, Paul, do, do what these guys are telling you to do. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying here that Paul received a special revelation to go to Jerusalem and to communicate the good news, the grand news that he was preaching among the Gentiles. The word preach there is in the present tense. And privately, says the text, privately to them who were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. I think... I think that took a revelation from the Holy Spirit. I do not think that that expression says, you know, that I was preaching wrong. What I, what I think that, express, that expression says is that what I've been preaching hasn't been accepted by the apostles or those who were of reputation. I do not think Paul is saying that they who were of reputation is, is saying that, uh, he's not saying that slanderously. I don't think he's uttering a criticism. I don't think he's saying that they thought that they were great stuff and they weren't. You know, I don't think that, not at all. I think he's saying that I went up and I had a private communication before those who were, who, who were of great reputation in the city of Jerusalem. I don't think there's any criticism in that verse at all. They were held by the modern Jewish Christian at that time in great respect. Great respect. They were the apostles of Jesus Christ. They did have reputation. There are those in the work of the Lord of great reputation. I praise God for His work in my life. And I praise Him that He's used others to do that. Tremendous people. I don't want to praise them because I, I want to try to shy away from that. But God used them in a mighty way in my life. And I am beyond thankful for that. These were people of reputation. And I believe the concern of verse 2, Paul's concern there is that maybe they were preaching a gospel that he wasn't preaching. And he knew that his was, was correct. I don't think that you should get the, the inference there that he was afraid that he was preaching the wrong thing. I don't think that's what it's saying. The inference is that in his effort, the Jewish leaders were not fully aware of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Hard for a Jew to accept the gospel. They, they look on it, you know, Paul is, you know, error. That's, that's error. It's bad. The Holy Spirit's driving the point home that our redemption, our being made righteous is the work of Jesus Christ and nothing more. Nothing more. Dearly beloved, what we preach is not popular. It wasn't to the Jews. It wouldn't have been to the Jews. I, I mean, stop and think. I, the grand news that Paul preached to the Jews would have been bad news. You know, you're, you're, you're preaching the wrong thing. All right. 
But we also have to recognize the fact that what we're preaching in preaching the true gospel, the grand news of what Christ has done for us, the body of Christ, the church, the gospel to the Gentiles, it's to the Gentile, to the Jew, it's the, the, the good news is too bad to be true. To the Gentiles, it's too good to be true. Steve, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but man, I just, I just that's just I, too good to be true. You know, I don't have to do anything to go to heaven. Christ did it all. That's just that's too good to be true. So we kind of catch it both ways. <laughs> and God designed it that way. I'm going to say this again. Of all the religions of the world, Christianity is not to be included. Don't lump it in with the rest. It's not a religion. It's unique. It's something other than all of those other religions because without exception, every single one of all these other religions are based on a system in which you gain Favor with God by what you do. Christianity is not that, never has been that, never will be that. Never will be that. And His sheep hear His voice. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Happy Dependence Day. I know it's Independence Day. or I, I know that this is the... Independence Day weekend. I'm going to say it a different way. Happy Dependence Day. Trust in Him. Though He slay me, yet will I trust in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.